every minute of every day, one of America's 600 railway companies rolls a train out of a terminal. Ever on the move, over the greatest network of rails in the world, trains carry people, goods, and mail. Mail by rail helps tie together the business economy, the free press, and the human relations of this great country. For a few pennies in postage, great industries, publishers, small businesses, and just plain people hire postal transportation service on every railroad crisscrossing the United States. There are hundreds of railway post offices built and owned by the railroads and rented to the Bureau of Transportation of the Post Office Department. Called RPO cars and manned by hard-working postal transportation crews, they provide almost half a billion miles of valuable service every year. In addition to trains, today highway post offices help speed the mail to every corner of the country. These vehicles regularly travel established routes on fixed schedules. Working with fittings similar to those in a railway post office car, one or more clerks and a driver serve about 20 post offices twice a day. In an expanding postal service, many forms of transportation are used. Among these are buses, trains, ships, and planes. Airmail service is also a vital activity. Mail of all classes, except that which may be damaged by low temperatures or high altitudes, is accepted for airmail. Postal transportation clerks distribute airmail in terminals right at the airfields, much the same as they work on trains and buses. Working the nation's mail 24 hours a day, seven days a week, takes a lot of men, an army of public servants. Who are these men? They might be like Kathy Smith, the man next door. Let's stay with him and watch a typical RPO clerk's workday right from the beginning. That's Cappy's wife. She's as proud of his job as he is. In addition to doing important work, the job is paying for their house and is sending their girl to college. The letter was from the office. Notification that Cappy was to break in a new man on his next run. In another part of the city, the substitute clerk, Phil Davis, was also getting ready. Like thousands of other clerks, regulars, and subs, he was doing his homework, stamping facing slips with his name, RPO train, and date. These slips are the means of tracing missent mail. Like all subs, Phil was excited about his new job. Until the skills were learned, it all seemed tough, which is natural. The package of slips are part of the equipment Phil will need on the job. Since he had time, the practice case was on his mind. And as he had done many times, he began throwing cards. This, in miniature, is the job of distributing mail according to a set pattern. In this way, all clerks learn the schedules and schemes and build up their speed. Their periodic examinations are conducted the same way. Rehearsed and confident, Phil was now ready for his first run as a postal transportation clerk. In Cappy's house, a similar scene was underway. Although he always kept his road grip packed, Cappy carefully checked its contents before leaving home. Tags and slips, revolver, holster and shells, schedules and schemes, badge and manual, goggles, pencils, twine knife, labels, stamp and pad. He knew that on the road, it's difficult or impossible to obtain the tools of his trade. After checking the grip, Cappy checked his wallet for travel commission, revolver permit, and money. In addition to lunch, there were work clothes to prepare and pack. Safety toe shoes, cap, gloves, shirt and pants. At last, Cappy was ready. He liked the layoffs his job gave him. The nature of the work requires working in accordance with railroad schedules. 
So this was goodbye, Mrs. Smith, until next week. As the city awakens, the railroad terminal comes to life. Here is where most postal transportation men have to report for work. At the transfer office in the railroad station was where Kathy Smith had the appointment to meet Phil Davis. This is the place where RPO crews assemble before going out to the cars, where they pick up notices and where they just meet the boys. Phil arrived first and was looking around as Kathy showed up. Kathy liked the boy right off. Thought he would make the grade because he showed interest. The old timer put the newcomer at ease by showing him the ropes. Explained the order book for special orders and general notices. After checking the RPO schedule, they went to the wall map where Kathy traced the geography of the trip they were about to take. The route, the time due at various towns, the pouch list, and the terminus. From the questions Phil asked, it was clear he was bright and had done his homework. Their next stop was the blackboard, where U.S. mail car assignments were listed. Together, they read the track location and number of their car. After Kathy explained the board, they headed for their car. On the way, Kathy warned the new man to be alert to new dangers to watch out for station tractors and railroad switching equipment. Cappy warned Phil never to cross tracks unless it was absolutely necessary. They watched a track man do it easily and right. There it was, an RPO car. 62 tons and costing more than $50,000. Cappy demonstrated the safe way to board. Grasp high up on the handrails, left foot on the first step, then shift weight to the next step. Duck low under the catcher arm. Phil got the idea. After sliding his grip aboard, he climbed into the car correctly. Cappy gave him a further word of caution. Never try to enter a moving car. As soon as Cappy switched on the case lights, Phil snapped on the car lights. They looked around the clean, quiet car and began to change into their work clothes. In a few hours, this calm scene will take on a new look as the train crew goes to work to sort the mail on the road, to catch the mail on the fly, and to help the letter carriers bring the public tidings of sadness and gladness, news and business. Right after they changed into work clothes, they strapped on holsters and pinned on their badges. They both knew the rules covering the use of firearms. Not to leave loaded revolvers at home, nor carry them loaded between home and depot. And finally, always to point the revolver downward to avoid accidents while loading. After Phil loaded his revolver correctly, Cappy explained the time rule. How, if a clerk is due to work at a certain time, he must be in work clothes and ready at that time. These men were working advance time, that is, time in which the crew prepares the railway or highway post office and distributes mail prior to the scheduled departure from the terminal. After Cappy unpacked his road grip and laid out the tools of his trade, he hung his clipboard. As supervisor, he had a lot more paperwork than any other clerk in his crew. Kathy was now ready to set up the car, and he asked Phil to help him. Together, they fastened the pedestals to the floor plate to provide a solid base for the tables. Next, they placed the center rods on top of the pedestals to support the full length of table. For now, they temporarily hung the sections of the distributing table on the crossbar. Eventually, these sections would be made up as a strong work table with stationary pedestal legs. Observing safety measures, Cappy showed Phil how to let down all the racks that would be needed. He particularly cautioned Phil against bumping his head on the overhead box hooks. Although Cappy was completely familiar with the car diagram, he hung it up as a guide for Phil. 
The car diagram showed where sacks and pouches were to be hung in each rack. Next, Cappy demonstrated how to check for mail which may have been left in the empty sacks, inserting his arm to open the entire sack for inspection. Then as Cappy hung the sacks, Phil took up the job of inspection, holding each sack open and looking for mail. The post office uses 25 million sacks and pouches. If a letter were lost in one of them, it might be lost a long time. The metal eyes were placed on hooks, so set that the sides of each sack became taut, leaving no space between sacks. After being pulled tight, the tie cards were hung over the rail and dropped into the sacks. Finally, all the racks were dressed. This business is full of such unique terms, and since they're widely used, it is well for all employees to know them. When Phil asked Cappy to check his work, Cappy pointed out a hole between the sacks where mail might slip through. This was easily corrected by rehooking and tightening the tie cords. Together, instructor and student checked over the job making sure the racks were dressed according to the car diagram. It was important to know the differences between a sack, which is used for newspapers and parcel post, and a pouch, which is used for first-class mail, and then the label holders for the two containers, as well as the different methods of closing. The sack is tied with cords, while the pouch is strapped and sealed with a lock. Yes, there was a lot to learn about the job of becoming a postal transportation clerk. Next, the labels. How they first mark the various separations and later serve to label the sacks when they're ready to be tied out. Labels have to be inserted according to the same diagram which set the pattern for hanging the sacks. Nothing to this job as long as you follow directions, but put one label in the wrong holder and an awful lot of mail may be missent. The substitute proved to be a quick learner, a necessary talent for all postal transportation clerks. Together, they distributed the labels in all the overhead boxes and in all the sacks and pouches. Now, they put sections of the distributing table in place. Cappy raised the table, resting the front hooks on the center bar, and being careful of his hands, grasped the back hinge hooks and released them to slip over the rod of the adjoining rack section. In this case, the diagram called for a double distributing table. And the men were ready when the mail arrived. As always, it was quite a load. When the mail porter got his truck in position, Cappy and Phil were on hand to take in mail for storage and for working. The mail was accepted and the load was stacked according to plan. As the sacks were taken on board, the labels were read quickly and accurately. Bulk mail has to be stored so that it may be unloaded at various points on the run. Cappy kept his eye on the sub. There were many safety precautions to observe while stacking bulk mail. Tie cords have to be kept out of the aisles. They're a tripping hazard. He showed Phil how to make a good base for the pile, arranging the sack so as to leave about an 18-inch aisle. A solid foundation will prevent movement of the train from toppling the sacks. Lifting a heavy item incorrectly risks injury. The right way to lift is feet apart, bent knees, back straight, firm grasp, and a steady upward thrust of the legs. Then the mail is stored between stanchions in such a way that the clerk knows what each separation contains. Phil soon got the hang of it and began to place heavy, bulky items at the bottom, starting the base of the pile as far out as possible. Together, they lifted the extra heavy ones. Two men lifting a load divides the weight.
In the meantime, mail was also being loaded in the storage car, usually adjoining the RPO car. As Phil continued to stack bulk mail in the RPO car, he learned that dragging the sacks is an easy way to move them. And as the piles got higher, Phil began to use the knee lift, which gave the load an extra push to assist in putting up a sack. Fragile items, like this box of chicks, were put aside to be placed on top of the pile. In the meantime, the remainder of the crew arrived. Supplies of twine and locks were unloaded and distributed to the men at their stations. The clerks immediately set up their cases in order to perform their advanced distribution of mail. Important mail like registered, which may contain money, documents, or any other things of value, is always given special handling. To maintain integrity of the mails, many procedures are followed which make it possible to know exactly who handles each registered letter every step of the way. For instance, one man on each crew is designated the register clerk, and reds, the familiar term given to registered mail, are his responsibility for the entire run. The man who handles registers should have special knowledge of routing and distributing registered matter. Registered pouches are sealed with special locks which record every time they are opened. After dumping the pouch, the clerk makes sure it's empty. The registers are individually checked before they can be written up for dispatch. The pouch man first distributes letter packages containing number one mail. Mail which can be worked later is held back. The letter slips are left on the top letter of each package in order that the clerk can check missent mail. Later, the same letter slip is saved as each package is distributed. Once the mail is ready, the clerk begins distributing letters by reading each address and flipping each letter into its right pigeonhole. Number one letter mail contains mail for the first towns through which the RPO will pass. The distributor at the paper rack gives priority to newspapers, parcel post and ordinary papers in just that order. But number one mail means what it says. It's worked first. Flipping newspapers neatly into the sacks is an art that all clerks learn. Just before departure, the transfer clerk shows up with a consist, which is a record of the cars in the train, the amount of storage mail loaded in the RPO, as well as the storage car. He also checks if there are any pouches which they hadn't received. To prevent robbery or mail falling out of the car, the doors are kept closed and locked. This is one job where a man can't be late in reporting to work. This office moves. People's mail, going someplace, coming from someplace. People's possessions, things they are buying, selling, or giving away on the moon. The most exciting thing about handling mail, when you stop to think of it, is that each letter contains a person's thoughts, his hopes, business, love, and promises, neatly folded in a tiny package. The important thing is that these men help make sure each item arrives at its destination on time. Once on a run, the schedule becomes part of them. Cappy checks his watch, spots a familiar landmark. Then knowing they were nearing their first station, begins to tie out packages of letters to be put off. And here's where the facing slip comes in. It tells who worked each package on which train and when. Every letter package is neatly tied with a minimum of motions. 
Then, with a finger knife, the twine is cut. These tie-outs are given to the pouch man who distributes them. Care is taken to get all packages of first-class letters for this destination in the right pouches. These pouches are strapped and locked and then taken to the end of the car for eventual dispatch. Sacks of newspapers and parcels are also tied out. To empty the overhead boxes, empty sacks are hung on the hooks below. Labels from the boxes are transferred to the sack label holders before the boxes are emptied of their contents. These sacks are then tied out and locked. With the help of the substitute, the load is moved to the car door. The train pulled into the station on time. Now, the mail was going to be transferred with the help of station employees and mail messengers. Phil was given the job to pull the box, which means emptying the letter box at a stop station. He emptied the box and was careful to carry the letters in a pouch. Locking the box, unloading and loading the sacks of mail, and the station transfer was completed. That's all there is to it. In that brief exchange, which happens every minute of the day, many thousands of people are swiftly served by the Postal Transportation Service. As the run gets underway again, the fun begins. Men working the mail race the speeding train toward the next station. It's a driving force that keeps them on their toes and never lets them quit. Now watch how they catch mail on the fly with the help of a mail messenger. Ten minutes before the train is scheduled to pass a non-stop station, the mail messenger carefully hangs the special catcher pouch of mail. After it is securely fastened, top and bottom, he steps aside and waits nearby to witness the catch and receive any mail which may be thrown off. Aboard the train, local mail is being tied out as the clerk spots his landmark. This was it. Must get every letter package for this dispatch in the pouch and tied out. The race against time and speed was on. As soon as the last pouch was made ready, the clerk grabs his safety goggles and goes to his station. The engineer is required to signal the RPO car that they are approaching a non-stop station. And a dramatic moment is at hand. In Cappy's crew, the local clerk was getting ready to make an exchange. First, he put on his safety goggles. Then he tried the catcher arm. This time, for Phil's sake, he demonstrated the mechanism, pushing down to show the catcher arm being lifted outside the train. 
With one hand, he tossed the pouch out and down, assisted with his foot. With the other hand, he brought down the catcher handle, and the catch was made. A neat two-handed operation. To save the public precious hours and days in delivery, railway mail clerks sort and exchange great quantities of letters and printed matter. Yes, men and mail in transit. Speed the mail on speeding trains, affecting dramatic exchanges almost every minute of the day. A bullseye. The dispatch was delivered. Now, Phil, wearing safety goggles, got his first chance to make an exchange. On the fly. Like Phil, all new men qualify themselves quickly, provided they take up this work with a sense of responsibility and willingness to devote their best talents and efforts to the service. Kathy was right. Phil Davis was going to make the grade. These men who treat the nation's mail like it's their own ask for no salutes. Few jobs are more exacting. These men know no night or day. They are possessed of a retentive memory and a sense of honesty matched by few. These then are your postal transportation clerks in action whose efforts and sacrifice speed onward the vital correspondence of our great nation come darkness, deluge, or disaster. When you drop a letter in a mailbox, you probably don't give a thought as to how it reaches its destination. Behind the delivery of your letter is the story of the Postal Transportation Service, often referred to as the backbone of the postal system. We hope that through this film, you will come to have a clearer understanding of the work postal transportation clerks perform and the skills required to keep the mail in motion. This is Bob Smith future postal transportation clerk. Six months ago, Bob took a civil service examination for employment in the postal transportation service and achieved a high grade. He also passed a rigid physical examination. The letter he is reading is an offer of employment as substitute postal transportation clerk. Following the instructions in the letter, Bob reports to the district transportation manager's office. The district manager explains that the basic function of the Postal Transportation Service is to transport the United States mail, to keep the mail moving toward its destination. That this work is performed in terminals, airmail fields, moving highway post offices, and railway post office cars. Bob learns that life in the Postal Transportation Service is one of continuous study and fight against time to get the mail home as swiftly as possible. He is advised that the work is arduous and for the most part performed during the night, that he will have to travel and be away from home a good part of the time. He is also told of the many advantages of federal employment. Bob accepts the appointment and immediately takes an oath to defend and uphold the Constitution of the United States. 
He is given the equipment necessary to protect the mail, to identify himself as a Postal Transportation Service employee and a commission for travel. Bob is now a substitute Postal Transportation clerk ready to undertake a period of training. Bob's first session with the training officer acquaints him with the fact that Postal Transportation clerks must study as well as work. The training officer instructs Bob in the use of the books he will study to qualify for the examinations he will take throughout his career. The book of instructions, which contains the rules of employment. The scheme books, which list in great detail the routes serving each post office and the schedules of railroads, airlines, highway post offices, and truck routes. The geographical location of each office is studied, and the routes serving the offices are traced and checked through scheme books and schedules. This is the heart of the training program. Through this process, the correct routing for each post office is worked out so that the mail may be dispatched to reach its destination in the shortest possible time. The correct route is noted on the back of the card containing the post office. Clerks must memorize not only the names of 5,000 post offices, but the correct routes for each. The various types of equipment and their use is explained by the training officer, as well as the proper method of locking and labeling. Bob is also informed that within 30 days he will be required to pass two written examinations and within 60 days he must pass an examination on approximately 800 post offices. Bob feels this task is impossible. He is told that all postal transportation clerks pass these examinations and if he applies himself he can do it too. Under the supervision of the examiner, Bob takes his first examination on postal laws and regulations. It consists of 50 questions. Bob studied hard for this examination and answered 48 correctly, receiving a mark of 96%. Throughout his career, he will be required to take written and case examinations every year. Every day of his working life, he will be learning new distribution and regulations, and there will be no rest from this continual process of accumulating knowledge. The first job to which Bob is assigned is in a postal transportation service terminal. These terminals are usually located at railroad stations. The mail is loaded onto belts, which carry it to the first section for the primary breakdown in the process of distribution. These terminals are a maze of belts, chutes, corridors, elevators, and moving trucks. Seventy terminals, manned by more than 10,000 postal transportation clerks, are located throughout the United States. These clerks keep the mail in motion from the time it is loaded onto the belts until it leaves the terminals properly dispatched via trains and trucks. In this terminal, located in Washington, D.C., 10,000 sacks of mail are processed daily. This job requires hundreds of highly skilled distributors who work around the clock, 365 days a year. As Bob has no knowledge of distribution, he can only perform the more laborious work in the terminal. This consists of pulling sacks from one truck to another and dumping up mail on a portable belt for distribution by experienced employees. It is a question of pull and lift and dump and dump. A tired substitute finally realizes that if he is to get away from this laborious work, he must learn something about the distribution and dispatch of mails. Like other postal transportation clerks, Bob spends countless hours studying the geographical locations and scheming out the correct route for each of the 800 post offices in his examination assignment. The following month, Bob takes his first case examination. He must know how to distribute and dispatch correctly mail for approximately 800 post offices. Postal transportation clerks must make a grade of at least 95 to pass. He presents his equipment, revolver, keys, scheme book, and schedule to the examiner who inspects them to see that they're in good condition and kept up to date. Every week, there are supply and schedule changes. Clerks must revise and restudy these supplies and routes to conform to these changes. Bob is naturally apprehensive. He gives the signal and begins casing the cards. Off to a slow start, he gains speed and finishes the examination at a rate of 32 cards a minute.
The examiner checks the cards through the use of a code on the back. He finds eight errors in Bob's examination and points out the correct supply for each office in error. Thus, Bob receives a mark of 99% on his first case examination. As he continues to take examinations, his confidence will grow. Within three years, he will have a working knowledge of approximately 5,000 post offices. Bob has now acquired considerable knowledge of distribution and is temporarily assigned to a terminal where bulk mails are handled. This is a simple distribution rack where sacks are made up for states and other postal transportation service terminals. Although Bob is working alone on his rack, he is part of a vast team where the performance of each individual affects every other individual in the organization. The process of distribution is like an endless belt. A jam up at any one point can cause serious problems throughout the entire organization. As the sacks are filled, they are labeled, tied out, and dispatched to the correct train for transportation to destination. Sacks of parcel post are dumped up on a portable belt where clerks, working at high speed, make the primary breakdown for the various racks in the section. Parcels of all sizes and shapes are thrown into tubs which go to the racks for distribution. It is easy to see the wisdom of the post office department in cautioning its patrons to wrap parcels firmly and securely. During an eight-hour day, Bob processes the equivalent of 160 sacks of parcel post for the states and terminals contained in his distribution. The tubs from the portable belt are brought to him along with a word of encouragement and advice. When the mail is kept in motion, this vast terminal is a smooth and efficient operation. However, the flow of mail varies and the distributors are contending against time to keep the mail moving. When the volume becomes too great and overtaxes the facilities of the terminal, it results in delays and increased costs. The most economical and expeditious method of handling bulk mails is to keep them in motion. That is the job these people are trying to do. Twelve billion pieces of third and fourth class mail are distributed and transported each year. To perform this tremendous task requires expert knowledge and close teamwork by postal transportation clerks. The transportation of mail by air is one of the responsibilities of the Bureau of Transportation. Airmail fields are located at principal airports throughout the country. Airmail is preferred service. It costs more, but if desired is well worth the money. It is possible to mail an airmail letter in New York City and have it delivered in London, England as quickly as a letter at the regular rate mailed in New York is delivered in Chicago. Incoming airmail is delivered to the Postal Transportation Service by the airlines. Two important tools a postal transportation clerk uses are the twine cutter and the thumb stall. The twine cutter is used to cut open and tie out packages, and the thumb stall is to put the letters into pigeonholes. Bob now has sufficient knowledge to work airmail into a complex distribution case. The jargon used in the Postal Transportation Service is peculiar. For example, Phil and North, number one and two, means mail in these pigeonholes will be dispatched to a railway post office train running between Philadelphia and Norfolk. The number one package is to be worked first because it includes cities near the beginning of the run, while the number two package contains mail for cities near the end of the run. Bob receives on-the-job training under the guidance of regular clerks. Here he is being shown the correct way to tie up a package of letters. He still hasn't learned how to hold on to a package with one hand while tying with the other much to the amusement of his co-workers. It is embarrassing to have to pick up the letters under the eyes of 50 fellow employees, but it will not happen too frequently because Bob is determined to learn how to tie out properly as quickly as possible. After the air mail has been distributed into the cases, the packages are tied out and sent to the pouch table where they are thrown into pouches of destination. Life at an air mail field is never static. Flight patterns are constantly changing which sometimes makes it necessary to use alternate routes in expediting airmail. Planes are grounded and mail must be routed to trains and trucks. The airmail clerk must not only know the proper supply and dispatch for fusion and dispatch for surface transportation as well. 
This complex system of looting requires specialized skill and flexibility, which is peculiar to the industry. Airmail field clerks distribute mail not only for domestic delivery, but also for many foreign countries. Many of these men are experts on foreign distribution. Here again, the clerks work around the clock and against time to distribute and dispatch as much mail as possible on each flight. 800,000 authorized airmail flights serving 550 cities carry one and a half billion pieces of airmail yearly. The post office department's latest innovation in transporting mail is the highway post office. With more and more people leaving the cities to live in suburban areas, the highway post office is becoming an increasingly important media in mail transportation. Highway post offices not only transport mail, but also provide facilities for distribution en route. Clerks are assigned to highway post offices and railway post offices and carry firearms to protect the mail. One of the great advantages of this service is that it delivers the mail direct to post offices along the run. Highway post offices are not restricted by the rigid schedules of railroads and airlines. Routes can be set up to meet the individual requirements of the post offices served. The direct exchange of mail is not only expeditious, it is also economical as it eliminates the need for motor vehicle and star route service. The flexibility of the hypo is the answer to the serious problem of providing good postal service during periods of shifting populations. As new communities are established, highway post office routes can be revised or new routes established and obsolete routes discontinued. Each year, more highway post office routes are added to meet the needs of suburban areas. At present, there are 140 highway post office routes which travel 15 and a half million miles yearly. The American people are on the move and the highway post office is moving with them. This is Bob's first trip in a railway post office. At the railroad station, he meets the crew he will work with, and they report to the RPO car to perform advanced distribution before the train leaves. This railway post office runs between Washington and Chicago. The empty car is hung with pouches and sacks according to an official diagram which accommodates the mail to be distributed and dispatched during the run. Each rack contains from 10 to 16 pouches or sacks. Each RPO car has a different layout because the scope of distribution varies for each run. Letter case headers are inserted in the pigeonholes for the city and state mail, which will be distributed and dispatched. Most postal transportation clerks work throughout the night so that mail will reach post offices early in the morning to ensure first delivery by letter carriers. Outside the car, there seems to be confusion as trucks of mail to be loaded or maneuvered into position, but actually everything is in order. A clerk calls out pouches in a jargon familiar only to the postal transportation clerks. Each run is scheduled to receive specific dispatches from post offices, airmail fields, highway post offices, and other railway post offices. A record is made of all pouches received and dispatched. As the time of departure nears, more and more mail is taken into the car and the speed of distribution is stepped up. The conductor gives the highball and the run begins. The pouches and sacks in the car contain first class letters and newspapers. Nearly 18 billion pieces of first class and 6 billion pieces of second class mail are handled by the Postal Transportation Service yearly. As the momentum of the train increases, letters are snapped into the pigeonholes with increased speed. The pouch table becomes the center of activity. Letter packages are thrown into the correct pouches. There is a spree de corps in the Postal Transportation Service that is unique. Postal Transportation clerks work in small groups or crews. They develop a high sense of teamwork and there is competition between crews which results in high productivity. At the other end of the car, our substitute, Bob Smith, is distributing newspapers. He flubs and hits his head on the hooks underneath the boxes. When he does this about 100 times, he will be a real postal transportation clerk. The speed of distribution now has reached its peak and will continue at this pace until the train nears the end of the run. They will pick up and dispatch mail all along the way. Here's where postal transportation clerks use their tremendous knowledge of distribution. 
Each clerk understudies one or more assignments and can step in and fill a vacancy at a moment's notice. When one clerk is current with his distribution, he steps in and helps those who are behind. Each of these veteran clerks knows the proper distribution and dispatch for approximately 5,000 post offices and unhesitatingly flip the letters into the correct separation. Clerks work not only against time, they also work against the sway and bounce of the speeding RPO car. One of the advantages of railway post office service is that it permits receipt and dispatch of mail en route while the train is moving. This provides good postal service for the smaller cities and towns along the run. There are several offices along this route where mail must be dispatched on the fly. These are the most exciting moments of the run, particularly for our substitute Bob Smith. The mail for dispatch is taken from an overhead box and enclosed in a special pouch. It is securely locked and brought to the door where the clerk will make the throw and catch. Clerks can easily tell at what point of the run they are by the feel of the car beneath their feet. The clerk designated to make the throw and catch is on the lookout for familiar landmarks as the train approaches the point where the mails are exchanged. The clerk goes to the door and looks for the crane upon which the incoming pouch is held. He throws the pouch, lifts the catcher arm, and there is the incoming pouch. The mail is brought to the pouch table and distributed swiftly so that the patrons at the next station may receive same day delivery. Our substitute, Bob Smith, has now satisfactorily completed his probationary year. He has been educated by the training officer and his fellow clerks in the rudiments of the job of keeping the mail in motion. A letter from his district manager offers him an assignment as a regular clerk in a postal transportation service terminal. He is now ready to take his place among those who have dedicated their lives to the principle that the mail must go through. With our great technical knowledge and resourcefulness, it may truly be said that neither snow nor rain nor heat, nor gloom of night stays these couriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds. The United States Postal Service, designed for progress from its earliest beginnings. In 1753, England appointed a Philadelphia printer and postmaster as joint postmaster general of the American colonies. Benjamin Franklin, diplomat, statesman, writer, inventor, and the father of our postal system. He took over a jumble of dirt tracks tavern table collection boxes and part-time couriers and forge them into an effective message delivery system for the new land, America's first postal system. One of Franklin's inventions, the pigeonhole sorting case, was the mainstay of early mail processing. To Franklin, the postal system was a fundamental public service for a society of free citizens, universal personal communication, to destinations near or far, a service open to everyone. Fired by the Crown because of his political activities, Franklin was appointed Postmaster General by the Continental Congress. By the time he left office in 1776, Franklin administered more than a thousand miles of well-tended post roads with regular deliveries to all of New England and into the Mid-Atlantic states. After the Revolution, the 13 original states moved quickly to admit new members, and the United States spread to the West and South. As distances increased, transporting the mail became an even greater challenge. Using the latest method available, the steamboat, mail moved the length of the Mississippi and on to California during the gold rush of 1849. The nation grew quickly from 3 million in Franklin's time to 25 million less than a century later, and the post office expanded to keep pace. By the late 1800s, the post office offered many of the products and services we know today. 
postage stamps, postcards, and city delivery had all been introduced. The nation continued to grow, and the post office took advantage of and often spurred new technology to grow with it. By 1869, railroad lines linked the east and west coasts, carrying letters and packages quickly and reliably. And services expanded as well. Rural free delivery, residential mailboxes, and branch post offices were all introduced after the turn of the century. The post office continued to adopt the newest modes of travel during the early 20th century, the horseless carriage and the aeroplane. In the 20s, the post office was recognized for its important contributions to the development of aeronautics. Meanwhile, mail carrying contracts contributed to the rail lines continuing rapid growth. For maximum speed, mail was sorted on board as trains roared from town to town. The decades between the world wars began with euphoria, but soon nosedived into worldwide economic depression. During the 30s, the post office continued to grow, benefiting from the nation's economic programs. During the Depression, many postal facilities were built across the country by the WPA, the Works Progress Administration. Ironically, in the 1940s, our nation's dramatic recovery from the Great Depression put the post office department through its most painful test ever. After World War II came the baby boom, a million addresses were added each year, and population growth shifted from the cities to the suburbs. At the same time, post-war prosperity fueled soaring mail volume. It doubled in just seven years. America had fallen in love with the open road, and public funds and tax breaks were shifted from iron rails to concrete ribbons. After years of complacency and neglect, the railroad system, still the workhorse of mail transportation, began to crumble. The post office was the victim of the same attitudes. Left to battle for subsidies every year, the department found itself struggling to survive. Without funds for new buildings, mail processing plants remained rooted in congested urban centers as they attempted to serve a more and more decentralized population. In the 1960s, the post office finally began to introduce an advanced method of mail processing, the letter sorting machine. And in 1963, the zip code made its debut. Zip codes laid the foundation for more efficient mail sorting and delivery. But even these initiatives could not overcome the years of neglecting needed improvement. In 1966, the nation's largest mail facility finally bogged down in a hopeless bottleneck. For three weeks, bags of mail piled up at the Chicago railhead as workers pulled double shifts just to sort it and send it out again. Facing what he called a race with catastrophe, Postmaster General Lawrence O'Brien called for a sweeping overhaul of the postal system. No more federal subsidies. No more political appointees the authority to manage its own finances, a break with the past. After lengthy debate, a united Congress acted decisively. Both Democrats and Republicans joined together to pass the most dramatic postal legislation in history, the Postal Reorganization Act of 1970. This landmark legislation created a new, independent, self-supporting agency of the federal government the United States Postal Service. Ben Franklin's brainchild had met its most challenging test. In the process, transforming itself into the most efficient, the least expensive, and the largest postal system in the world, designed for progress. Today, we deliver 40% of the world's mail volume. The new Postal Service pays its own way with income generated from sales of its products and services and uses no tax dollars to support its operations. It's a public service, but it's run like a business, competing in the marketplace for customers and revenue. The Postal Service combines solid business practices with innovative delivery methods and high-quality service. Every year, 
mail volume sets a new record. We deliver more than half a billion pieces of mail each day, six days a week. Advanced technology keeps pace with this growing mail volume. This new advanced facer canceller cancels the stamp and separates barcoded mail from other mail at the rate of 10 pieces per second. The computer-readable barcode is at the root of our high-tech solution for mail processing. It allows a computer to sort the mail more than a hundred times faster than hand sorting and at one-tenth the cost. The first generation of barcode sorters read the barcode only along the bottom edge of the mail piece. The wide area barcode reader looks at the entire face of the envelope to find and interpret the barcode. By 1995, all mail will have a barcode placed on it, either by the Postal Service's advanced technology or by businesses that prepare their mail for automated sorting. To achieve that goal, we encourage high volume users such as business and other organizations to pre-print barcodes on their mailings. The benefits are dramatic. To sort a thousand pieces of mail the way Ben Franklin did would cost $33 today, while processing those thousand pieces of mail on the barcode sorter costs only $3. The difference, when multiplied by the billions of pieces of mail we deliver each year, represents a huge savings for the Postal Service and ultimately for you, the customer. Lower costs translate to more reasonable postage rates for consumers. This optical character reader can actually read an address, check a database of nearly 120 million addresses, and barcode the mail piece at a rate of 35,000 pieces per hour. And the remote barcoding system allows operators using a video terminal to automate even hard-to-read mail. Not all of our innovations are behind the scenes. We're bringing new products and services to our customers. This retail postal store is one example. With stamps by mail, stamps by phone, stamps sold in grocery and drug stores, and even stamps in automated teller machines, we're bringing the postal service closer to our customers. We've met our past goals and set ambitious ones for the future. Postal rate changes below the rate of inflation, greater employee commitment, and higher quality service are all a part of our strategic plan for the future. Our focus on performance is more than just words. The Postal Service has retained independent survey organizations to gather objective data on customer satisfaction and on-time delivery. The Postal Service's design for progress doesn't end with technological advances. Our commitment to our employees is another cornerstone in the plan for the future. With employee involvement teams operating in thousands of facilities nationwide, our employees contribute to day-to-day -day management decisions. But the mandate the Postal Service was given in 1971 doesn't end in the 1990s. We are committed to examining our past and ensuring that our charter gives us enough flexibility to carry America's communication into the 21st century. Advanced technology, innovative management, customer satisfaction research, quality services, objective performance measures. This is the new Postal Service, a government entity that's also an efficient business owned by the American people. But the Postal Service is something more. It is universal service delivered for the price of a stamp, a good neighbor in the communities across the country, a national asset owned by the people, designed for progress and ready to meet the future. The United States Postal Service, we deliver. We're a part of your country, part of your town. Faces you see every day. Now we're pulling together, counting down.